Hello everyone and welcome to Crown Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic, we review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sabba Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we're going to talk about a paper that recently came out uh, on the BJS. It's a randomized clinical trial, uh, followed by a teaching session by Professor Sabobar Subramanian uh, on randomized clinical trials. Uh, this will be the first of few uh, teaching sessions on the topic. Ray, cholangiography in elective laparoscopic cholecystectomies. Uh, this was performed in a research centre linked to the University of Copenhagen in Denmark and was published in February of this year in the British Journal of Surgery. So cholecystectomy is one of the most common abdominal surgical procedures performed and one of the most feared complications, as I'm sure some of you are aware, is bowel duct injury. This can result in significant morbidity and a mortality of up to 18%. Now, intraoperative cholangiograms are used to try and minimise the risk of bowel duct injury as they delineate the anatomy and help the surgeon intraoperatively. But their uptake is inconsistent as they include x-ray radiation to the patient. And because you have to cannulate the cystic duct, they do introduce a potential risk of iatrogenic injury. So fluorescent cholangiography, which is quite a novel technique uh, developed in 2009 by Ishizawa et al. Um, and the link to that reference can be found in the original paper. Um, fluorescent cholangiography is a non-invasive method of imaging the biliary tree. You inject fluorescent dye into, into the vein and then using infrared imaging, you'll be able to uh, visualize the anatomy of the biliary tree. So this study was primarily looking into comparing the intraoperative fluorescence cholangiography with x-ray cholangiography in terms of its ability to visualize the critical junction in patients who undergo elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy for complicated gallstone disease. And we'll go into what gallstone disease, complicated gallstone disease was defined as in a moment. But Josh, would you like to start by going through what the critical junction was? Yeah, so um, the critical junction is basically the junction between the cystic duct, the common hepatic duct, and the common bowel duct. It is essentially where you would put the clip and then um, excise the gallbladder. So um, this is a non-inferiority trial, and they hypothesized that um, the fluorescent cholangiography and um, the x-ray cholangiography has the same ability to visualize the, this critical junction in patients with complicated gallbladder disease. Uh, ben, can you tell us more about this study design? Yeah, so as Josh said, it is a non-inferiority randomized control trial. It was done in a single center in Denmark, and the um, study was conducted between March 2015 and August 2018. They allocated patients based on simple block randomization, not stratified randomization. And that's important to consider when we come on to the limitations in the study. They reduced selection bias by concealing allocation with concealed envelopes. And it was a single blinded study um, in which the patients were blinded to what imaging modality was conducted. The procedure took place um, and the imaging uh, took place intraoperatively when the patients were anaesthetized, so they weren't aware of which imaging uh, they had. Now, the um, Josh, do you want to go through the outcomes of the study? Yeah, so the primary outcome is, as we have discussed, is to see whether the both methods can visualize the critical junction. Then there are several secondary outcomes. Um, they also want to know whether the um, extension of the um, common hepatic duct, the common uh, bowel duct, and the cystic duct can be can be duct can be seen. Um, the duration of using the fluorescent and also X-ray was also measured. 
the surgeon rate the difficulties from one to five, and they also recorded um, intraoperative and postoperative complications. So these are the major outcome that they wanted to measure. Ben, um, can you tell us about the characteristic of the of the patients? Yeah, so as previously mentioned, um, they used patients who had complicated gallstone disease, and these were in the elective setting. So they classified complicated gallstone disease as patients who had gallstones with associated cholecystitis, pancreatitis, cholangitis, or common baldock stones. But they weren't operated on in this study with when they were in the acute phase. It was at least five days post-acute um, admission. And if the patients were found to have a common bile duct stone uh, pre-op, they were removed via ARCP before the imaging took place. You can see uh, that they originally had 100, sorry, 1,889 patients who were eligible, but the majority were excluded because they didn't meet the inclusion criteria, largely because they were either acute operations or they were uncomplicated gallstone disease. So they had 60 patients in each group. And they were, uh, there was no significant differences between the groups, other than in the fluorescence cholangiography, there was a greater proportion of male patients um, in that group, which you can see the table there on the right side. Um, as Josh has already alluded to, the assessment of the critical junction, as well as the secondary outcomes, was all intraoperative assessment by the um, operating surgeon. Interestingly, they did do a pilot study prior to conducting this randomised control trial, whereby they had a radiologist and a surgeon assessing the images post-operatively. But from what I can gather in the study, the kappa Cohen was less than 0.7, which meant that the uh, decisions uh, by the radiologist and the surgeon could not be agreed that they weren't due to chance. So therefore, they changed their method um, to get the operating surgeon uh, assessing the imaging intraoperatively. Josh, would you like to run through the outcomes? Yeah, so um, the major primary outcome is there was no significant difference between the two groups in terms of their ability to um, visualize the critical junction and also um, the free ducts. Um, however, um, um, in terms of um, something very interesting here is um, the fluorescent group takes a lot shorter in comparison to the X-ray group, but there is no difference in the total median operation time in between two groups. Now, um, the fluorescent is a bit weaker in terms of identifying the left and right hepatic duct compared to the X-ray group. In comparison, in the X-ray group, um, nine patients um, couldn't have the X-ray cholangiography. And basically because they have got a non-patent cystic duct. But for the rest of the patients, 85% um, of them who uh, had a x-ray cholangiography, they can basically visualize every single duct that they want to visualize. So um, in comparison to that, 82% of patients in the fluorescent group were able to see, you were able to see the um, critical junction. Um, in terms of um, surgeon's preference or let's say surgeon's um, uh, feeling about difficulties, there is significant um, difference between the two groups. And in summary, the surgeon feels that the fluorescent is easier than the X-ray um, cholangiography. So um, this is the finding of the paper. Ben, um, what's the limitation of this paper then? Yeah, so the, the lack of blinding of the surgeon does lead to observer bias and that um, the surgeon's preconceived perceptions of both imaging modalities may affect his overall opinion of the quality of anatomy delineated. Um, furthermore, the age of the patients who were actually included in the study were actually younger than those who were excluded. So that does run the risk of a positive bias um, within this study. And we may start overestimating the possibility of these positive outcomes. Furthermore, in the fluorescence group in particular, there is a risk of negative bias. And this is mainly down to the lack of stratified randomization, uh, block randomization that they did. 
So they didn't do stratified block randomization, which meant that they had an unequal number of male patients in each group. And as a result, they predicted that the um, increased abdominal obesity within male patients may affect the uh, ability of the rate of the um, fluorescence to be identified when assessing the anatomy of the biliary tree. Um, furthermore, they didn't actually abide by the manufacturing guidelines of the fluorescence injections in that they didn't give the adequate three hours preoperative time for it to be absorbed into the biliary tract. They only gave it one hour. So therefore, the, the results in the fluorescence group may actually be underestimated. Uh, the study was a single centre, so generalising the results um, can be difficult. And also, we have one surgeon who's assessing the anatomy uh, intraoperatively, and we weren't sure from the paper itself whether his assessment was actually validated or not. Moving forward, implications for future practice. Well, fluorescence clangiography is a non-inferior method of intraoperative biliary tree visualisation. It has shown a potential role in the acute setting, given that x-rays are limited uh, in acute cholecystitis. Josh, would you like to just give a brief summary? Yeah, so in summary, according to this long inferiority inferior triode, the fluorescent cholangiography is not worse than x-ray cholangiography at identifying the critical junction during laparoscopic um, cholecystectomy. Um, the strong point of this study is that it is a randomized and controlled triode. It's got um, a co concealed allocation, um, and they have set out to measure what they wanted to measure, and it's got a lot of future potential in the futures. Um, unfortunately, there are some weak points of this study, as Ben have identified. There are several areas that there could be um, observ of, of observation, observation bias, and also uh, inclusion bias. Um, the block randomization, if it was improved to stratify randomization, can hopefully improve that. And it's also a single center study. So this is a summary of the paper. So um, if Ben, if you, have, if you haven't got anything to add, I'm gonna uh, invite the audience to ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, this will be a short introduction to randomized control trials. Um, I think uh, we will need to do a few more tutorials to cover um, randomized control trials in some depth. And uh, I was thinking for a while um, about exactly what I should include in the introduction, and that took me a lot of time. So my slides may be a bit patchy this time, but let's see how it goes. So like I said before, I might pause and ask um, questions, um, and I'll leave it open-ended. I won't um, mention anyone by name. So uh, but please feel free to pitch in and um, give your answers. It doesn't matter if the answers are right or wrong. It just um, shows uh, that you guys are listening to me and then you're engaging and uh, uh, it'll be good to have a little, bit of an, a little bit of a discussion as we go along. Right, so what is a randomized control trial? Now I'm sure all of you have heard of randomized control trials, but it's um, always good to just refresh our memory in terms of uh, uh, trying to think about exactly what the phrase means. So let's um, split the phrase into its uh, component words and talk about them. So a trial. So a trial is a planned experiment that is meant to evaluate the, the effects of an intervention. So essentially it is an interventional study or an experimental study. Like we discussed uh, in uh, the previous tutorial, we talked about interventional studies and observational studies. Clearly, any trial is an interventional study because it is a planned experiment. So what's a control trial then? A control trial simply means that there is a control group with which you can compare the effects of the intervention in the intervention arm. So as opposed to a single arm study where there is no control group, a control trial has a clearly defined control group. So what does randomized control trial mean? Again, it's simply a control trial that randomly allocates participants to different arms of the trial. So as to reduce what we call selection bias. So the investigator, the researcher isn't involved in allocating um, patients as per his or her whim. 
into either the treatment arm or the control arm. There is a process which hopefully will completely randomly allocate participants and reduce what we call selection bias. I'll talk about selection bias in a bit more detail in a couple of minutes. So essentially, what we want to ensure is that every participant that gets into the trial has the same probability as anyone else of being allocated to one of the different arms in the trial. It's not equal probability. Again, I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. But remember that every participant has the same probability as any other participant of being allocated to one of the different arms of the study. Now, it's always good to keep in mind a, an example. And for us surgeons, maybe a surgical example, so as to uh, be able to relate to this example as we talk about some of these abstract concepts. So being a thyroid surgeon, um, I thought an example, a good example would be um, low-risk thyroid cancer. There is controversy regarding the extent of surgery in low-risk thyroid cancer. Some people say that a hemithyroidectomy is sufficient and others insist on total thyroidectomy for all cancers. And uh, there's a lot of argument in the thyroid surgical community as to which treatment is better. So if you're doing a randomized controlled trial to address this question, you would start off with the null hypothesis being that there is no difference in the risk of recurrence between hemithyroidectomy and total thyroidectomy in the treatment of low-risk thyroid cancer. So we'll keep that example in the back of our mind, minds while we talk about um, some of the principles of RCTs. Right, so um, the first question uh, that uh, often comes up is why do we need a randomized controlled trial? We have got observational evidence to show that total thyroid, total thyroid is better, for example. So the reason, the most important reason, somebody needs to unmute their microphone, I think. The most important reason uh, is that this is the best uh, design available to us to measure and compare the effects of different interventions. Like I've mentioned before, any study design is prone to bias and error, and it's often very difficult to get to what we consider to be the truth. And uh, um, all studies have their own sort of specific limitations, and this is the best of what we've got. And why is it the best? Because it addresses or reduces various types of bias seen with observational studies. And one of the most important types of bias that you see with observational studies is what we call the selection bias. And the randomization method um, aims to address, remove, or eliminate selection bias. Now, so what is selection bias? Selection bias is a bias that can result in a systematic difference between the two arms of the trial, or it, you result in a, it results in a situation where the groups that you have um, selected are different from the population, from the general population, in some way. And that some way or some variable or characteristic by which the groups are different can influence the relationship between the exposure or the intervention and the outcome of the trial. So essentially, uh, in sele uh, by selection bias, we mean that there is a bias in how you've selected the um, groups that form the different arms of the trial. Now, uh, there are a number of different examples of selection bias in the literature that have uh, resulted in results uh, that are not necessarily true or have been disproven later on. And a, a classic historical example is something that I thought I will mention very briefly, um, if only um, uh, for historical interest sake. So, Almost 100 years ago, people used to wonder about the relationship between tuberculosis and cancer. And there's a lot of speculation in that time that people with tuberculosis, especially active tuberculosis, probably were protected against cancer or did not um, get cancer. And this is um, the prevailing hypothesis um, at the time. So there's a very um, uh, famous clinician scientist called Pearl at the John Hopkins University, who 
who then set about to test this hypothesis by conducting a case control study. So what he did was he selected 816 patients who died of cancer and another 816 patients um, um, who had died of non-cancerous conditions. And they did an autopsy study. They did match the um, cancers and the non-cancer group uh, by age, gender and race. And the finding was that in the cancer group, 6.6% of patients uh, or, or autopsies revealed active tuberculosis, active lesions. Whereas in the non-cancer group, 16%, over 16% had active tuberculosis, almost three times. And they concluded that maybe there was a link between active tuberculosis and not getting cancer. And this created such an interest that people, including Pearl and his colleagues, started to propose that tuberculosis somehow stops cancer from getting worse and maybe even prevents cancer in the first place. And therefore, they extracted tuberculin. You've probably heard of tuberculin, which is an extract from mycobacterium tuberculosis, and injected tuberculin in patients with advanced cancer in the hope that that might somehow stop the cancerous process, which to no one's surprise didn't really work. And people then realized that the problem with this study, with this entire study, despite it having been done by some very clever people, was that the non-cancer group was not representative of the general population in that they had selected non-cancer patients from the group of patients in hospital who died of other infections. And the leading cause of death in those days, uh, leading infectious cause of death, was tuberculosis. So there was a bias in the selection of the non-cancer group. So that is a, um, a good historical example of selection bias that resulted in spurious treatments being implemented in many patients. Okay, let's carry on talking about why we need randomized controlled trials. So, so far we've said that randomized controlled trials um, are the best uh, study design that we have available, and it addresses a really important source of bias called selection bias. Right, they also provide us the basis and the information that we use to facilitate decision making while we come to treat um, uh, our patients. So they give us information on benefits in terms of recurrence of disease, survival, and so on, and also on harms of the intervention in terms of the side effects of surgery, complications, and so on. And you can evaluate a number of different outcomes, although we have one primary outcome in a randomized controlled trial and several secondary outcomes. You do have good information on all of these outcomes that can be evaluated in a rigorous scientific manner, and, and, and uh, you get information on all of these outcomes you then use to make decisions. So it is the basis of what we call level one evidence. And just to remind you of the evidence pyramid or the hierarchy of evidence, you've, pro you've probably seen this um, diagram in a number of different um, uh, sources. So you have anecdote or expert opinion at the bottom of the pyramid of evidence, and then you have case control studies, and then cohort studies, which provide better quality evidence, and then you have randomized controlled trials, which then form the basis of systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which give us the level one evidence that we all crave for when we um, strive to use best available evidence in the management of our patients. Okay, so uh, we've covered why we need randomized controlled trials. Now let's now reconsider our scenario. We talked about the extent of thyroidectomy in low-risk thyroid cancer, and I briefly mentioned that there's a lot of controversy between uh, doing a hemithyroidectomy versus a total thyroidectomy in low-risk cancers, and lots of advantages and disadvantages with either approaches. Now, just to summarize the advantages and disadvantages, especially for many of you who may not um, have been exposed to thyroid surgery. So with a total thyroidectomy, you reduce local recurrence rates, and there's less need for redo surgery in the long term. With a hemithyroidectomy, 
the, the proponents of the hemithyroidectomy would say that although the local recurrence might be a little bit high, there is no impact on overall survival or disease-specific survival. And the proponents of hemithyroidectomy would also say that the complication rates are lower than hemithyroidectomy, and in the long-term complication rates, complications after thyroid surgery can have a significant impact on quality of life and uh, add to the morbidity for these patients. And uh, the debate has been going on for decades. And just recently in the UK, we have set out to do a multi-centered randomized controlled trial called the HOT trial, the H-O-T, HEMI or total thyroidectomy trial. And this trial is due to start later this year. So let's just keep this trial in the back of our minds as a good example of discussing the principles of randomized controlled trials. Right. So the first question that we ought to step back and ask ourselves is something, um, is the question, is there clinical equipoise? Now, I suspect uh, you would have heard of the term equipoise in, term, in relation to ethics. Now, what it means here is that there is a genuine uncertainty as to whether a hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy is better for these patients. There's a real or genuine uncertainty. And if there is no genuine uncertainty, and if observational evidence is overwhelming that total is better, then you're not ethically um, correct in running a randomized controlled trial, right? So that'll be pretty obvious. But the problem comes in how to determine if there is clinical equipoise, how to determine if there is genuine uncertainty. So the first issue would be, which benefits do you consider? Do you look at disease recurrence rates? Do you look at overall survival difference between a hemi or total? Do you look at the complications? Or do you look at all of the benefits and harms and somehow weigh them all um, together in a complex equation and then say that there is no big difference? And would you consider cost benefits? A total thyroidectomy would be a one-off operation. Patients uh, would probably be easier to monitor and it might be beneficial for society to do total thyroidectomy, especially if there is no major difference in the other outcomes. Would that come into the equation when you think of equipoise? What about um, whose benefits or harms to consider? Do you, do you look at the benefits in terms of the individual patient, or do you uh, look at benefits um, to the society in general? Let's say, uh, there is a very expensive treatment. Let's say, to, um, for example, the total thyroidectomy is extremely expensive, and if it's really uh, marginally good for the patient, um, but hugely detrimental to society, um, would you take that into account? How about the argument that uh, you might be diverting resources from other uh, parts of healthcare and public health? Should that play a role? Who decides whether equipoise exists? This is a big problem because there are, like I say, some proponents who would say total thyroidectomy is really the best way forward for their patients. And at the other extreme, there are other people who would say hemi is much better. Now, if you have surgeon A who says total thyroidectomy should be done for all of these patients, should he then recruit patients into a trial of this kind because his own personal beliefs and prejudices are in favor of total thyroidectomy. If he doesn't recruit patients, is he denying his patients the chance to have a hemithyroidectomy or the chance to participate in the trial? So is the equipoise, should it be in the minds of the investigator enrolling patients or should there be equipoise in the general scientific community? So that's another question to think about. So I hope that makes uh, uh, equipoise a bit uh, clearer. Now let's just move on to um, objectives of randomization. Um, I, I can take a little pause here and see if you have any questions before I carry on. I've not got anything in the chat. Not got anything in the chat. Okay, shall I just carry on then? I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what are the objectives of randomization? Now, the key objective is to ensure that participants in the various arms of the trial are comparable. So that 
other factors, when I say other factors, I mean factors other than the intervention, other than the hemi versus total, other factors that might equally affect outcomes are distributed equally in the two arms. Now, if all the other factors are distributed equally in the two arms, and then you find that total, for example, is better than hemithyroidectomy, then you can establish causality. You can say that total thyroidectomy was what resulted in better outcomes and not the other factors. And if the other factors are not equally distributed, then it becomes a little bit of a mess. Now, you've got to keep in mind that most outcomes in clinical research trials are multifactorial. And we can talk about some of the factors that can affect outcomes in thyroid cancer. Do you want maybe um, um, anyone wants to comment on what factors in thyroid cancer um, affect outcomes apart from the extent of thyroid surgery? Well, I can take some of that on. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the histological factors, so the type of cancer you're treating, yeah. uh, papillary follicular anaplastic um, and subtypes of the papillary can cancer, yeah. uh, as well, that some of them carry a worse prognosis, specific uh, histological factors related to number of mitosis and um, uh, sort of proliferative indexes that get evaluated. Uh, positive lymph nodes, um, obviously presence of distant metastasis. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I think those are the main the main ones I can get on top of my head. Yeah. Um, yeah I would say. Yeah. So, so the more you think about it, the more factors you'll come up with. You could say patient-related factors. Is the patient very mor morbid? Obesity hypertension, diabetes, uh, other comorbidity, renal disease, lung disease, so on and so forth. Yeah. Gender, age. Those are all patient related factors. You could talk about disease related factors, stage of the disease and extent of the disease, grade of the disease, TNM and some of the other factors you've mentioned. You could talk about surgeon related factors or treatment provider related factors. Is a surgeon, does a surgeon have enough experience? Does he or she have uh, enough expertise, quality of the surgery um, based on his uh, or her experience? And then you could talk about uh, the setting. Is it in a tertiary center or a small local hospital? What about the people providing adjuvant treatments? What about the effectiveness of radioiodine, TSH suppression, and so on and so forth? So if you're the domain expert and you sit down and think about factors, you come up with a dozen or more factors that could affect um, a particular outcome, let's say death from thyroid cancer, okay? And you're doing a randomized controlled trial evaluating one of those factors, i.e. extent of surgery. The other issue is you could sit down and list 12 different factors, and those are the factors that you know about. What about all the unknown factors that we haven't been able to list down or we don't know about? So thyroid cancer, as with any other uh, any other solid cancer, has a number of unknown um, influences. There's so many things we don't know about thyroid cancer. How are they going to be um, fair between the two groups? And they need to be balanced, both the known factors and the unknown factors, before you can attribute the improvement in outcome to a particular intervention. And that's why um, uh, trials are difficult to do, clinical trials are difficult to do. Right, so how can randomization help us with this? So random allocation, you would expect and hope, would distribute the confounding factors, both the known factors we talked about and the unknown factors, equally in the different arms of the trial. So that's a key objective of randomization. And any every participant, and this I'm repeating from uh, what I said um, a few minutes ago, Every participant entering the trial should have the same probability as any other participant of being allocated to any of the treatment arms. So that is the second objective of randomization. Now, I think here I should be explaining um, 
what is meant by randomization ratio. So randomization ratio is simply uh, the ratio of um, uh, participants in the different arms of the trial. For example, a one is to one trial would imply that the clinical trial would aim to um, equally allocate participants to one of the two treatment arms as opposed to a one to two um, ratio where every participant would have twice the chance of getting into treatment B, for example, compared to treatment A. And the third kind of, there are a number of uh, ways in which the ratios can work, but another, the third example that I've got on the screen is a one is to one is to two um, ratio, which simply means that there are three treatment arms and the third treatment or treatment C, if you like, has double the number of patients as either treatment A or treatment B. Now, I presume it's in uh, straightforward to understand that some trials might have three treatment arms. There could be um, uh, two new treatments compared to a standard treatment or uh, one new treatment compared to two different kinds of standard treatments. But why would you, why do you think you might have a trial that has um, more patients in one of the treatment arms than the other. Any um, any guesses in answering that question? Uh, no. So um, if you think about um, uh, certain trials that study maybe a complex intervention or a very expensive intervention, you might not want to. Um, you might not have the resources or the ability to. Um, subject many patients to this new complex expensive intervention. So you might want to limit the new intervention to just a few uh, participants, whereas with the standard treatment um, where, in, where there is no lack of resource uh, or availability, you could have many more participants. So if you wanted to keep a sample size high enough, but you don't have enough uh, resources to implement the new treatment, then you could say that you would have a ratio of one to two, where uh, just one third of the patients in the trial get the new treatment, while two thirds get the standard treatment. So there are uh, so that is a good example of why you would have unequal um, allocation um, to the two arms of a randomized controlled trial. But again, you've got to make sure that the randomization process ensures in a one to two ratio trial that every participant has one in three chance or a 0.33 um, probability of getting the new treatment. So I hope that explains the uh, randomization ratio. Right, so there's two important concepts that need to be adhered to in a good randomization. One is that we need to generate the random sequence well before the trial starts. And that's really, really important because that's the only way you can ensure that each participant entering the trial at any stage has the same probability of getting into any of the treatment arms that are available. So you have to keep in mind that in a randomized controlled trial in, a, in the real world, participants enter the trial at varying times. You don't have 100 patients waiting on day one to be allocated to two different treatments. Your 100 patients with thyroid cancer will accrue over two years or four years or five years. So if you have the random sequence generated before the trial starts, then as and when patients come in, they will slot into the sequence one after the other. The other concept to keep in mind is that the random sequence need to be concealed from the investigator recruiting patients, which is what we mean by allocation concealment. And as uh, in the trial that we discussed today um, shows that you're able to um, conceal the sequence from the investigator enrolling patients. Therefore, you reduce further any potential selection bias that can occur. So if the investigator doesn't know what comes next in the sequence, then he or she is not going to be biased towards either including or excluding the patient. If the investigator is aware of what comes next, let's say the, the investigator knows that in the sequence, the next two are total thyroidectomies, and he has a young female with a very small nodule where he thinks that total thyroidectomy would be overkill, he will 
he or she will be inclined not to include that one patient in the trial. And they might say to the patient, well, they might not discuss a trial or they might look for reasons to exclude the patient from the trial and do what they consider standard treatment, which would be a hemithyroidectomy. So I hope you, that that explains to you why it is important to keep the sequence concealed from the investigator recruiting patients. Okay, right. Now there are some alternatives, there are lots of other ways of uh, um, assigning participants into different arms of the clinical trial that have been used before. Uh, we'll just run through a few, you might have heard of these. So one is potentially by date of birth. You could say, I'm not going to do this randomization malarkey, I'll just um, put patients who have even numbers as the date of birth into the hemithyroidectomy group and odd numbers into the total thyroidectomy group. Or you could say, I'll go by the first letter of the surname, these particular letters will go into hemi and the others would go into total. Or you could say that patients uh, coming in the months of January, March, May and so on will have hemithyroidectomy and patients coming into the trial in, in the alternative months would have a total thyroidectomy. These are all uh, methods what are now considered to be pseudo-randomization methods. They're not really randomization. And they're considered bad because they, one, are not um, real um, uh, true randomization. Two, the investigator that enrolls patients would know for sure what um, uh, uh, treatment awaits any patient that he or she is enrolling into the trial. And if he or she is, um, is prejudiced against that treatment, then they'll make sure that or they could be biased towards excluding the patients getting into the treatment. So that's why these methods are not considered good quality. What about toss of a coin? Toss of a coin, you could toss a coin each time the patient, uh, each time a new patient is eligible, but again, that won't work because you have not generated the sequence before the start of the trial. And there's nothing stopping you from tossing a coin again and again if you don't like the result. So that um, is uh, another reason why uh, tossing the coin won't work. What about sealed envelopes in a box? You could put um, a hemi, you could write down hemithyroidectomy and total thyroidectomy in a, a number of sealed envelopes, put them all in a box and take them one after the other and allocate the appropriate treatment as every patient, every new participant comes into the trial. What's the problem with that? Any uh, any guesses? I think we were going to mention, Saba, that if they're not opaque. Let's say they're opaque. No, if, if, if you can see through the envelope, um, then it's not randomization. Yeah, let's say you can't see through the envelope, it's completely opaque. Well, my my high school professor used to pick random students uh, for interrogation, and she just used to pick until the right one came out. So <laughs> presumably you can do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is that is true. But you've only got so many envelopes, and each time you pick an envelope out of the box, you have to use it. The problem is, after you, uh, let's say you've got 50 um, participants to randomize, and you randomized 45, and you only got five envelopes left in the box. And let's say, by chance, you've exhausted your total thyroidectomies and you only have five hemis left in the box. Everyone would know that because they'd know that 25 patients have had the total thyroidectomies. So yeah. the investigator enrolling patients will know what's coming next in the last five. Okay. And also, we said, or we promised, that by adopting a randomization, a proper randomization method, every participant entering into the trial will have the same probability as everyone else in getting either a hemi or a total. But you're not giving the same probability for the last five patients. Okay? So sealed envelopes are okay as long as the envelopes have been kept in a sequence and you don't change the sequence. Sealed envelopes in a box are not okay. All right. Okay. Let's uh, carry on and discuss a practical example. We go back to a scenario of low risk thyroid cancer. And let's say we've got a population and that you want to randomize. 
um, and you're only randomizing T1 and T2 thyroid cancers. So um, just to give you um, an understanding of what these uh, figures are, so you've got male with T1 tumor, the T1 tumor males are smaller in size, just figuratively. Then you've got male with T2 tumors, big blue. You've got female with T1 tumors, small reddish orange, and female with T2 tumors, I'm sorry for the typo, uh, that is represented as a big orange figure, T2 tumors. So that's the population. You've got about 30 patients here. Um, you assume that these 30 patients will accrue over the period of a year or two, and you want to do a randomized controlled trial and randomizing to either a hemithyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy. Okay. Now, a lot of trials initially um, followed the principle of what we call simple randomization. The one is to one refers to each participant having the same probability, i.e., 50% of being randomized to either hemithyroidectomy or total thyroidectomy. So that's your randomization ratio, okay? So you have your population, you randomize, uh, you generate a random sequence, and I've, I've got a random sequence generated here, which goes TH, TT, TH, TTH, and so on and so forth. And uh, this is a simple, this is a sequence generated by what we call a simple randomization method, that allocates patients to either a total thyroidectomy or a hemithyroidectomy. Okay, so this method is very valid and is often effective. However, sometimes, although the aim of randomization is to distribute the numbers fairly equally between the two groups and make sure that the known confounding variables and the unknown variables are distributed equally, you can get in, into problems like in this example. So you've got a lot more patients in the total thyroidectomy arm compared to the hemithyroidectomy arm. You've also got a lot more females in the total thyroidectomy arm compared to the hemi. And we know that females uh, with thyroid cancer have a better prognosis than their male counterparts. And you've also got a lot more small tumors in the total arm compared to the hemi. So despite doing things by the book, you have got unequal distribution of confounding variables following what we call a simple randomization method. So simple randomization is good, but sometimes you can have problems. And therefore, people have looked for alternatives. There are a number of alternatives to simple randomization, and they're all listed in this um, slide. You've got block randomization, stratified randomization, and then two other special modes of randomization called cluster and adaptive randomization. So I'm going to talk about them in a bit more detail in a subsequent tutorial. So for the moment, I'm going to conclude, and we've discussed what a randomized controlled trial is, why we need randomized controlled trials. And just to summarize, these are the best study design we have, they reduce a number of different sources of bias that are seen with observational studies. We've discussed one key type of bias called selection bias. We've also said that RCTs provides the basis for level one evidence and gives information on the relative benefits versus harms on a number of different outcomes. We've talked about clinical equipoise. We've talked about two parts to a good randomization method. The first one is to generate the random, random sequence a priori, i.e. before the start of the study. And the second part is to ensure that the investigator who enrolls patients is not aware of the sequence. So the investigator does not know what comes next. And then we talked about what we call simple randomization. We talked about the problems associated with simple, simple randomization. And the next tutorial will look at some of the solutions that can address the problems associated with simple randomization. That, that's it. Thank you very much.